Let's see here. Let's see. Let's see what I got. What I got. Ah. Let's see, is anybody on here? Anybody? Anybody? It is after 12 o'clock. I'm late. Y'all supposed to be there. Well, Joyce is there. And Kim is there. Hey, Kim. Great job with your reading programs. Lady Glass is there. Cheryl Binion Jackson. Hey, hey, hey. I'm running a little late, but I'm glad y'all on time. Hey, Jasmine. Sister Blue, how you be? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you wonderful people. Sister Adams is on board. Hey, hey, KC is watching. Good to see Crystal Thomas in the room. Sister Nita Holmes, bless you, bless you. I watch my time today, don't let it get too far away from me. Sister Rogers and Kevin is on board. Latrice, Sister Paulette White, bless you. So your low is in the house. Heather. Sean from down south is watching us all the way from Louisiana. Sister King, lovely Diana, a Diane. Hey, Taya, good to see you. Bless you, bless you. Bless all of y'all. Sister Hicks, Yvette is on with us. Got a lot to cover today. Cheryl, hey, I'm praying for you, girl. Really, really praying for you. Hang in there. Hey, Minister Wiley, bless your heart, girl. Good to see you on board. Terrence is on board. That's what I'm talking about, TP. Lily and the gang is on board. Tell Robert I said hi along with Vi. Hey, Mary. Mary, Mary, my mama watching. Hey, I got to behave myself. Sister Fuqua. Tina Durrell is getting in the routine. Go on, Tina, with your bad self. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Listen, uh, uh just grateful for another day and grateful that God has been as good as he's been to, to me and to you and to us. As a people, we need to pray and uh, continue to stay uh, vigilant in our passion and pursuit of God. We live in a crazy world with some bad people and some mean people, some uh, illogical people. The truth of the matter is they are just um, ungodly people. They have not invited God into their life or they have not put God in his proper perspective. And so God has us here to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We're here to make a difference. And that's a, that's a reality that we have to continually live with. Uh, as we're gonna talk about today, you have to um, contend for the faith or you'll concede to your fears. And uh, I'm not giving in to no fears. I'm gonna continue to stand on uh, what God has for me and for his people and for all people. And uh, that's righteousness and justice and fairness, um, uh, employment and provision and protection uh, for everybody everywhere, whether they're in the United States of America or whether they're in Europe or whether they're in South Africa or Australia. Uh, God so loved the world and it's our job to continue. Hey, Papa Abraham, um, it's our job to continue to uh, let our light shine. And um, I say that soberly because, you know, the situations that are going on in our world and in our community here in Detroit, you know, really is sobering, really, really, really is sobering. Uh, and if I didn't know Jesus, but it, it would not be good for me and for the people around me. But I'm so glad that I know a God that uh, is really is in control. And uh, We've been talking about um, God speaking to us through, uh, uh, through his voice and how to hear the voice of God and looking at the various ways that God has, has spoken uh, in our past. And so, uh, hey, Renetta. Uh, so I want to begin with a, a word of prayer and then I wanna look at uh, some other ways that God has spoke to us and continue to speak to us uh, that we might hear his voice in his uh, book, uh, uh, Whispers, Hearing the Voice of God by Mark Batterson. Um, he says that our primary problem is with hearing. And if we heard the right thing, we would behave better. And he says what we're not hearing is the voice of God. 
And so let's pray that God's voice might be heard today and always in our lives, that we can uh, follow that voice and that we can obey that voice and that we can live that voice, that we can be like John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness of our world. Let's pray. God, how we love you and how we bless you. As we pause to exhale, as we pause to inhale what your Holy Spirit was breathing out upon us, we invite you to come and uh, have your way with us today, that we might hear your voice a little clearer, that we might be drawn nearer to you, that uh, we might hold you dearer to our hearts, and that you might be pleased in all we do and all we say. We are grateful for this day, in spite of the challenges of this world, we still know your word is true. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And most of all, God, there is nothing impossible with you, that whatever is impossible with man is possible with you. And so we ask you to come and uh, speak to our hearts through this lesson and through this time of sharing today. We love you. We adore you. And we're so grateful for life, health, and strength. In Jesus' name, we pray and we give thanks. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, being so faithful and being on board. We've been looking at uh, um, how to hear God speak. The last couple of weeks, we've been uh, focusing more on the uh, second half of the book by Mark Batterson, uh, Whispers. I highly recommend it for those who are trying to sensitize themselves uh, more to the uh, voice of God and be able to hear and uh, follow that voice. Uh, we looked at last week how God speaks through his word and that the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, that the word of God really is the key of all keys, that all the other uh, entities and means that God speaks to us are to be filtered through the word of God, that God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through our passions, that our passions are cues and clues of God's purpose for us. And when we learn to interpret our passions, uh, we'll be able to interpret the voice of God through our passions, that we understand that we are here on purpose and our purpose is hidden in our passion. God speaks to, to us through his word. He speaks to us through our passion. He speaks to us through opportunities or the doors that he opens for us. And uh, that when we see certain doors, that all opportunities don't come from God. But there are certain opportunities that when they happen, uh, we know it's from God. And one of the key um, factors for me to recognize any of these voices is that uh, we know it's God, I know it's God, when there's a certain level of peace that comes with it. Uh, there's a certain, certain level of internal uh, peace and, and confidence to come with it. We may not have all the logic. We may not know exactly how we're going to do what we've been told to do, but we know what it is we're going to do. And there's a level of peace, even in the midst of the potential danger, even in the midst of the potential problems, we have this peace that this too will pass and that God will give us the desires of our hearts. And um, uh, the opportunities that come before us, the passion that comes out of us, uh, with it comes a sense of peace that this is what God would have us to do. The other thing that we looked at last week was that how God speaks to us through our dreams, that the visions and dreams that uh, comes into our head and comes into our mind at certain times uh, is clear that this is something that is from God because, again, of the peace that comes with it, because of the opportunities that come with it, because of the people he lines up with it. In fact, that kind of gets us to the, the three things I want to cover today as how God speaks to us. Uh, Hebrews 12 and 1, Hebrews 12 and 1 says, the first part of that says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so great a cloud of witnesses. And here's um, the fourth thing, or the fifth thing, rather, uh, that God speaks to us through. We hear the voice of God amazingly, is that God speaks through people. Yeah, I know that's real deep, but People often overlook that, that God speaks to us through people. And um, the people who have been in our lives, you know, people who have influenced our lives, family, friends, coaches, teachers, pastors, leaders, 
who have made deposits in our lives and made our lives richer because of their investment, God speaks to us uh, to, through people. And for those who don't think that God speaks to us through people, so what do you think God, you know, he just speaks through an animal? And yes, he does. You know, he spoke through a donkey in, in scripture and he can speak to us through the clouds. And this is one of the humblest things about, uh, for me, when it comes to preaching and declaring God's words, that I know that God could, you know, put John 3.16 on a cloud and let the cloud go over around the city, and he would draw more people to him than he would through me. But yet he chooses to speak through me or speak through human beings. And uh, we, we need to address the fact, or we need to prepare to accept the fact that indeed God speaks to us through people now. Having said that, I must also say that uh, not everyone that speaks to us speaks for God. Uh, the people who God speaks through in our lives are usually uh, friends, families, foes. But sometimes he does use random strangers to give us a word uh, from him. And we know it because of the sense of Conf uh, confirmation we get on the inside that the voice we're hearing is not just their voice, but uh, this is the voice of God, that God speaks to us through people, just as he spoke uh, to David through Nathan, uh, just as he spoke to Esther through her uncle Mordecai, uh, just as he spoke to young Timothy through uh, seasoned senior preacher Paul, God speaks to us through people. And let me say that uh, before I make this, this transition, this turn, that if we want to hear the voice of God, we must allow uh, somebody to speak into our lives. We have to give somebody the authority to speak into our lives, to uh, allow them to be um, um, the voice of God, if you will, the voice of at least the voice of reason and the voice of accountability. This whole mindset of I'm grown, I can speak for myself and I can do what I want to do, that's straight, from, that's straight from, the, from the pits of hell. God wants us all to humble ourselves and allow him to use whoever he chooses to use to speak in our lives. And so we need people to speak uh, to us and God speaks to us through our lives. At this point, I have a special guest that's going to join us. Uh, to give us an example of God using people to speak in her life, guess who it is? It's Lady Sandra. <laughs> Hi. I actually have like like three examples of, well, at the time I didn't know it, it was, but in retrospect. So in my career, in my healing, and in health issues, I'm going to give you guys three examples. So the first one um I was working for Department of Defense and kind of like getting burnt out mode. No, I needed to do something different. And I was just seeking God. And I, and it's almost like when it's time to move, God will nudge you to do something. But you sometimes you don't pay attention to that, that nudge, right? So he has to do something else to kind of make you pay attention. So um, it wasn't one of my enemies, but it was a co-worker that worked with me and we were both always in meetings and sometimes it would be con contentious at times. But one day we, we got out of a meeting and he um, said, hey, Sandra, did you see this post um, about this announcement, this job announcement? And it was, you know, for a professor and, I, and me, I'm like, I don't think I qualify for that. Sure, I've done training, this, that, and the other, but I'm like, no, it's not me. So ended up, he said, Sandra, you need to apply for this job. Why is this guy telling me to apply for this job? I really like what I'm doing, but I was also looking to maybe move back down south. So anyway, I went I went ahead and applied. I got the job. So that's the way I ended my career. But that was God kind of speaking through to let me know it's time to move. It's time to go. So that was one instance. The next instance is uh, when I met my husband some year, a few years ago, and I was still kind of grieving uh, my daughter's death. I mean, I, it was at that point, I think it was maybe 10 years that I had been grieving, but 
Um, you know, when a child dies, it's hard for you to move past that. You do the blame game, like shoulda, woulda, shoulda, couldas, and all those things. And I still hadn't gotten over her death per se. So my husband come in my life to kind of speak some things and say, hey, look, you really need to pay attention to the things that you're feeling and deal with them uh, because I was, I, I had some guilt. I was blaming myself, you know, for recommending her to go into the military. I was doing all those things. So he recommended that I read this, the book, the, Sh the Shack, and he read it with me at the time. And out of that, so much healing came forth, but he encouraged me to deal with with those feelings and emotions that I hadn't dealt with, which God was trying to, you know, uh, bring to my attention anyway. And the third one is the health issue, right? So recently I've had some health concerns and um, not only did God speak to one person, but he spoke to two people to get to me. And um, that was really crazy. So uh first my my dad told me he said you know because he fasts all the time he said you need to fast and pay attention to you know when you when you come off the fast pay attention to the foods that you're eating and how they affect your body i was like oh, okay daddy you know i just kind of brushed it off and then my husband didn't know that i had this conversation with my dad and he w woke up one morning and was talking to me and he was like you know lord just a person but impressed upon me to tell you to fast and when you fast after you fast when you start eating again pay attention to the foods that you were that you're eating i was like oh god is really speaking to me so once i did that i incorporated the fast and i started paying attention to the foods that i eat i'm 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 so much better but those were three instances where God used people to speak into my life, and I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go nowhere. <laughs> uh, thank you. Listen, let me give you some, uh, uh, what Mark gives into his book. I want to share with you some uh, insights for allowing people to speak into your life and uh, some guidelines for us speaking into other lives. Um, uh, first thing he says, few ground rules for listening and talking. The first rule he says, no one is above rebuke. That when we get to the point that no one can check us, we about to wreck us. That uh, no one is so holy, no no one is so righteous, no one's position is so high that there's no one in this in this life that cannot rebuke them. Because really, it's not so much that the person is rebuking you, is God trying to get your attention that something is corrupt and something needs to be corrected. And when we get to the mindset that we are too big and too bad, too holy, or someone else isn't great enough to rebuke us, we're in trouble. So that's one. The second thing he says is don't let the arrow of criticism, don't let the arrow of criticism pierce your heart unless it first pass through the filters of scripture. That is, when folks go to criticize you, you need to measure that up to the word of God to see how it lines up with the word of God. That you don't just let folks just speak anything into you because what God uses these other uh, our venues to speak to us, whether it's our passion, our opportunities, or people, they all have to line up with the word of God or at worst, they cannot contradict the word of God. So don't let the arrows of criticism pierce your heart unless it pass first through the filters of scriptures. Another thing he says is that we ought to listen long and hard before giving out advice. I have come to grips with the fact that most of us struggle with uh, helping other people because we don't listen to other people. We're so busy formulating our response upon the first sentence or two or three sentences that comes out of their mouth that we don't hear the rest of the story. We're not good listeners. The Bible says that we ought to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. And uh, it could be because God gave us two ears and one mouth that we ought to be more, uh, be better listeners. And when it comes to talking and speaking into the lives of others, let's practice listening long and hard before giving out any advice. Uh, the last two things he says is that we should always encourage before we correct. 
That simply says that you know you you put some butter on it before you cut it. Uh, that you 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 tell folks what they're doing right before you tell them what they're doing wrong. And uh, the last thing is uh, really powerful and has helped me throughout uh, throughout my life, and I'm embracing it more and more as I get older. And that is when it comes to having tough conversations. Tough conversations get tougher the longer you wait. That when you got to have a tough conversation, go ahead and have it. Uh, go, go ahead and have it and, and watch God speak uh, through you because oftentimes, as uh, Lady Sandra just mentioned, I did not know that Papa Abraham had already talked to her about that same issue. I just knew the Holy Spirit was quickening me to talk to her about it, and I was simply being obedient to what I knew I needed to do because God don't have to give me, and neither do we have to give you the whole picture as to why he's telling you to do something when he wants you to speak into someone else's life or when he's trying to get you to hear what he's trying to say through people because God speaks to us through people. The second thing that uh, um, I want to share with you today that comes out the book uh, is the sixth uh way that God speaks to us is not only does God speak to us through people, and I, I thank God that he speaks to us through people. Let me say this, because we would be looking kind of crazy uh, going around here talking about the bird told me that I need to uh, change careers. We'd be looking real stupid, you know, talking about, well, the, the butterfly came by and said, look, I need to go get into my, my cocoon and stay there for the rest of the day. Uh, but God uses people that he know we can relate to that's why he came as one of us. That's why he sent his son to, to live as a baby and as a child and as a man so we can relate with him because he know we relate with those that we can identify best with. So God speaks to us through, through people. But then Mark says that God speaks to us through what he calls promptings. I call them timings. Promptings are those nudges that comes from uh, within that, that says something is going on here or something is about to go on or something needs to go on. You can't really uh, put a voice to it. You can't really uh, uh, put too much to it other than the fact that it, you sense something needs to happen. He calls it promptings. Here's what uh, a couple of scriptures says. Uh, Second Peter 3 and 8 says, With the Lord... One day is, a thousand, is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The ecclesiastical writer says in the third chapter that to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. And then the ecclesiastical writer, writer takes the next eight verses, and he lists 28 different times of things to happen. And the implication is that we need to know what time it is. We, we need to know what, what time it is because God's timing and our timing isn't always the right time. Isn't always the same time. In fact, the scripture speaks of two different times. There's the chronos time, uh, which refers to clock time or calendar time. Uh, it's where we get our English word chronology from. And chronos is sequential. It goes past, present, future. Uh, is linear. It moves only in one direction. Uh, but the second word for time in Scripture is chaos, kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, kairos. And it refers not so much to, to linear time, but opportune time. It means something is, is the opportunity is present. Uh, here's the way I like to look at it. Kronos time speaks of minutes. Kairos time speaks of moments. Moments are special times where minutes are just passing time. Uh, chronos time speaks of seconds. Again, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Kairos time speaks of seasons. That there's a season for something to happen, a season of time uh, for something to happen. Uh, I'm mindful of uh, what happened with the children of Israel when God uh, gave them liberty to uh, leave the wilderness. Uh, uh, and, and go into the promised land. And they were given that, that liberty to go into the promised land just shortly after coming out of the Red Sea. But they became so fearful that, uh, that they would encounter enemies and they would encounter uh, opposition that would defeat them that these children of Israel, they decided they wasn't going to do it. They told Moses they wasn't going to do it. 
And what happened is that they let the window of opportunity, they let the Kairos time close. And when the Kairos time closes on you, then you're going to need some more Kronos time to wait till the next Kairos time come. That God, when God gives us a certain timing for something to happen, either you act in that timing or you have to wait till God give you another chance. And I, I've been there where it seems like when the window closes that, uh, you know, you lost your chance. And um, I want to encourage somebody to know that even though you didn't act when you should have acted and that window closed, uh, by grace and mercy, if God gives you some more chronos, he'll open up the door again. He'll, he'll open up. He'll open up uh, 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 the opportunity again. I, I give you a, a, a few examples of this in in my life. Uh, I recall early in ministry, I was working full time for Generous Motors and pastoring, and I knew that I couldn't do both uh, efficiently at the same time. And I told God, if He gave me opportunity, I was going to uh, leave Generous Motors and go to ministry full time, even though we barely had 50 people. And uh, even though the offering wasn't that great, I just believed God. And I, I believed uh, in the call that he had upon my life. An opportunity came like maybe six months after I, I prayed that prayer. The opportunity came for me to leave uh, my job and, um, and I chickened out. I, 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 I talked myself out of it. So, well, I got a young family. I got some kids. I got a wife. And uh, I got to have benefits, and this church ain't there yet. Maybe not now, maybe later. And I remember the day that they closed the opportunity for us to get a buyout. And, boy, it was like I missed my opportunity to get saved. I mean, I felt really, really bad. I knew that window had closed. And all I could do, all I could do was repent because I knew I had missed it. I knew that it wasn't nobody's fault but my own that I did not walk through that door that I didn't have the faith at that time. And so I just repented. I told God I was sorry. I told God I promised him. I said, you give me another chance, I'm out. No questions asked. I don't care if the wife don't care for it. God was afraid she wasn't going to like it. I was afraid other folks going to say I was a fool. I was afraid of what other I told God I didn't care. And so when he gave that next opportunity to, <laughs> to get out of there, I got out of there. I got out of there, and I haven't looked back, haven't missed a meal nor a bill. God has been good to me. I think of another Kairos time. Uh, after living uh, in my second home for 18 years, I heard God speak to me uh, and say, it's time to move. And that was a big word for me because I had publicly said I was never moving again. I was not going house shopping again. I was not going to engage in that terrible aspect of packing up all the stuff you gather over the years and then loading it up and then got to take it someplace and unpack it. I was never going to do that again. And... Um, I thought I heard God say, it's time for you to move out of this house. And I uh, was golfing with my buddy, Pastor Branch. And um, as uh, we were golfing, I made the comment. I said, man, matter of fact, we just finished golfing. I said, man, I got to move. And he had just moved. I said, man, I, I got to move. He said, why you got to move? I said, the Lord then told me, you know, it's, it's time for us to move. And uh, he said, hold on a minute. And he went to his car and he got this flyer of this house. And uh, he said, hey, check this out. I said, man, you crazy. <laughs> I can't afford that house. That house is too much for me. He said, yeah, ain't nothing but money. With God, you can do anything. And uh, I went home and I prayed about it and uh, told the family about it. And long story short, things started to happen. And uh, from being 18 years in one place, in less than, in less than three and a half months, I was in a new house because of God's timing. I can say the same thing about the building that the church currently uh, worship in. Well, we're not worshiping in it now, but the building that we own, <laughs> that uh, we were in our other small building doing wonderful. We were doing two services, churches were packed, you know, things were growing left and right. And uh, I was having uh, a lunch with Pastor Butcher and he had a flyer and I asked him, hey, what you, you about to buy that church building? He said, no, that building too far west. I need some on the east side. And uh, I heard the Holy Spirit just prompt me, just kind of say, hey, you need to check into that. And so I said, hey, can I have that? And she said, sure. And he gave me the flyer to the building. I came back to the building. I told Sister Adams, who was the secretary at the time, 
I said, get Deacon Adams. I said, let's go look at this building. We went and looked at it that day. And uh, long story short, eight months later, we were in the building. All about timing, all about, all about timing, that God speaks to us uh, through timing. And we, we have to recognize when God's timing is at work in our lives. Uh, the scripture, um, one of the scripture examples is what happened in Esther chapter 6. If you get a chance to read it. It, it talks about how uh, the king, um, who was about to be approached by Haman uh, to, uh, to, to kill or to, uh, to destroy Mordecai and his people, but before Haman could come to him, the day before Haman or the night before Haman came to him, the king couldn't sleep. No big deal. Insomnia happens from time to time. But, but this particular time, he couldn't sleep, and he had a desire to have some history read to him. And so he asked his uh, 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 armor bearer to go get him uh, a history book from the library, and they came back with the, uh, with the portion of history that recorded where back uh, several years ago, the king had a couple of traitors who were plotting uh, against him to kill him. And uh, the traitors were uh, turned in by a guy who overheard them planning and told it so the king was able to uh, knock off their plan. And so the king asked, hey, what happened to the guy who turned in the traitors? He said, oh, nothing. We never did do anything for him. He said, well, what is his name? And the, and the king, and they told the king, oh, his name was Mordecai. Timing. And the king said, well, we must do something for Mordecai. And in Esther chapter, chapter 6, we see how God's timing pricked the mind and the spirit of the king where the king couldn't sleep for some reason and then pricked his mind to have a desire to read history. Coincident? No, divine providence. Mm -hmm. And pricked the page that they would turn to in history that reminded him that he owed somebody a favor who had done a great favor for him. Timing. And then so the next morning... He said, I got to do something about this unresolved issue. And he hears somebody coming in the court. He said, who's that coming in the court? He says, Haman. And so Haman comes in. He said, hey, Haman, what, what should the king do for somebody who has uh, been unrewarded for a great uh, 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 task that they did? And Haman, thinking he's talking about him, Haman said, well, I think he should have a, a parade thrown in his honor. I think the king should let him ride in his horse and in his chariot. And, and, and the king said, well said, Haman, not knowing anything about Haman's agenda, said, well said, Haman, uh, why don't you go do that for that guy named Mordecai? It's just awesome the way God's timing is impeccable. That when we sense that uh, God's timing is speaking to us, it's ours then to obey it. Mm -hmm. and, and listen, this, this, this prompting, this nudging, it's just something, it's a, here's what we call it sometimes, we have a gut feeling. Uh, well, we, we sense this is the time, this is the thing to do. And every child of God, every child of God has that experience from time to time where, uh, where we sense that this is, this is what I need to do right here, right now. We can't always explain it. We can't always articulate it. It's just something we have to do because God is prompting us to behave in a certain way. And God, when God is prompting us, he's usually setting us up for something good and great to happen to us. Happen to us. We just have to be obedient um, or else we will, uh, our delay will cause us to miss out on something really great in our lives. So God speaks to us through people. He speaks to us through his timing in our lives. And when we move according to his timing, things happen for us. When we don't, we need more chronos to get to our next kairos. And and our, our chronos days aren't promised to us. So when God gives us seasons, when God gives us moments, uh, then we need to seize the moment. Yeah, we need to seize the moment because God speaks to us through these seasons and through these moments so we get the most out of life. So here we are. God speaks to us through people. God speaks to us through uh, promptings. But now here's one of the most powerful um, voices that God speaks to us through is not one of the most popular ones, but it is one of the most powerful ones. And that is God speaks to us through pain. Yeah. He speaks to us through, through our pain. 
You know, the Bible is a real book about real people with real pain, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual pain. And um, it's the language that all of us uh, know and we cannot ignore. Uh, the oldest book of the Bible is the book of Job. And the book of Job is really uh, about pain and suffering. And pain, of su pain and suffering of a good guy. Pain and suffering of someone who um, even God declared was perfect and upright. That uh, pain and suffering has no respect to person. Um, and one of the many truths about the book of Job is that we ought not to pretend like pain don't exist. Uh, that that bad things don't happen to good people, uh, and the whole the, there's a whole theological debate about who's a good person or are there any good people? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, that that pain is real in our lives, and even though pain is real in our lives, we still have to have a perspective that God is speaking to us, yes. and that God's voice can can be heard. And like Job, sometime in the midst of our pain, we could be crying out, wondering if God hears us, if God is distant from us. Mm -hmm. That Job perhaps could be said was like uh, Jesus on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That in the midst of our pain, where we sense that God is furthest away, it's usually when God is closest to us. For Jesus looked the best on the cross and Job looked best when he was going through what he went through. And the latter part of Job was far better than the former part of Job, but he had to go through the first part to get to the latter part. Mm -hmm. And and God uh, speaks to us in our pain. C.S. Lewis says that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. And uh, sometimes our greatest joys come right after our worst pain, ask any mother of a newborn, that uh, sometimes our greatest joys come right after our worst pain. Uh, someone asked me the other day, what is my favorite Bible character? And uh, my favorite Bible character uh, outside of Jesus is, is Joseph, uh, Jacob's uh, youngest, uh, second to the youngest boy. Because um, so many life lessons and so many things like Jesus he experienced. Um, you know, Joe in his teenage years had zero emotional intelligence, just like a teenager. <laughs> he didn't know how to keep his, his pride and keep his dreams to himself. But he learned some things through his pain. He, he learned some things through his, through his pain because pain really is a teacher for us. Um, my, pain is a professor of theology. Pain is a marriage counselor. Pain is a life coach. Uh, nothing gets our attention more fully than pain. Uh, it breaks down our false motives and our, our false idols. It reveals where we are hurt and where we need to be healed. And, and pain is the process through which God often purifies us. Amen. Yeah, he's, it's the process through which God purifies us. Uh, some of my most painful moments uh, are where I learn some of my most valuable lessons. Uh, I talk about it from time to time, you know, the the pain, uh, and I need to finish my book on this, the, the, the painful lessons I learned through divorce and uh, learning to start over and learning to live life alone, learning to get my head and heart right for a good, healthy uh, relationship uh, that I never would have learned had I not went through the pain um, that I went through. Uh, Joe... Uh, perspective of pain was like this that when I've gone through the fire <laughs> I would come out as pure gold that Job understood and here's where the child of God has to understand that God gets no pleasure in our pain God isn't some kind of creature that gets joy uh, out of inflicting pain uh, I recall my um, my uncles on my father's side my uncles and aunts on my father's side when they would sit around the house playing cards and one of us would do something wrong and my dad would whoop us. And while we was getting the whooping, they would be laughing. <laughs> they would be laughing. It's almost like they got joy and pain. They got joy out of our pain. They would laugh about how we jumped and hollered and cried. 
all that. But that's not God. God, God isn't like that. God, God does not get any pleasure out of our pain, but he does know how to use our pain to purify us, to make us uh, better. And uh, here's what we have to come to grips with, that God speaks to us through our pain and that uh, our, our lives are better because of it. And that all of us uh, speak or have to deal with this language of pain. Job, Job, I told you, he lost everything. Sarah, she wrestled with the pain of infertility. Moses wrestled with the pain of being a fugitive and a killer. David wrestled with the fact that his father-in-law tried to kill him. Mary Magdalene wrestled with the fact she had seven demons in her. Peter wrestled with being impulsive and self-doubter. I mean, throughout scriptures, all the characters had certain pains. But you know, one of the uh, reoccurring miracles of Jesus, one of the few reoccurring miracles of Jesus is that he would, he would often heal lepers. And part of the problem of leprosy is that leprosy numbs our feelings so that we cannot sense uh, pain in our bodies. And so you could get cut and not know you're cut. You could get burnt and not know you're burnt. And Jesus restored unto lepers the gift of touch. Mm -hmm. And with the gift of touch came the ability to experience pleasure that they had not experienced before, but it also gave them the ability to experience pain. That God knows our pain and he's working his plan out through our pain. And God wants us to have the gift of touch and the gift of feeling so we can uh, become better through our pain. Listen, in our pain, we get to make a choice. Yeah, we get to make a choice. And here's some choices we get to make. Either we contend for our faith in our pain or we concede to our fears. You either contend for your faith, you fight for what you believe, or you give in to what you hate. Yeah, you, you, you either stand down to what confronts you or you stand up on the promises of God that he has for you. In our pain, we need to be asking God, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? What do you want me to know and what do you want me to do? You know, as I spoke earlier about the pain, uh, and I had several, but uh, in the pain of, of my divorce, I had to come to grips with some issues that, that was wrong with me and some perspective that was off in my eye and in my heart. Uh, but uh, God said, look, don't, don't give in to your fears. Uh, instead, fight for your faith. You know, contend for your faith. Contend for your family. Contend for your dreams. Contend for uh, your marriage. Contend for the country that you live in. Contend for the truths of God's word. God wants us to contend, not to concede. God is not a quitter. God is not a quitter. He don't want us to be a quitter. And just because you experience pain does not mean that you don't have purpose and does not mean God wants you to quit. No, no. No, no, no. God wants us to hang in there and fight. God wants us to contend for what we believe in, not give in to what we are afraid of. One of the reasons why you need to contend is because God contends with you, that you are not contending by yourself, that you're not fighting the pain. You're not enduring the pain by yourself, that God is in there with us. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. In his book, uh, Mark Patterson, as we wrap this up, in his book, he says the hardest praise is often the highest praise. The hardest praise is often the highest praise. That when it is the darkest and when it is most difficult for you to cry out hallelujah is when that is the best praise that you can offer unto God. That when you sense that God is furthest, maybe that's when you need to speak the most boldest to him. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace, not because you feel like it, not because you're worthy. And we often struggle with this sense of worth. I don't feel like I'm worth it. Well, let me help you out. You are not worth it. I'm not worth it. None of us are worth it. But because of God, listen, it's because of who God is that we praise him, not because of what we do. No, because of who he is, we, we give him praise. And, and, and we need to learn to give him our highest praise and our highest praise come at our hardest times. Yeah, our hardest time. Uh, Mark says, if what you don't turn into praise will be turned into pain. And he says, one of the ways we deal with our pain, uh, he said a couple of things. I add a third thing to it. He said, first of all, when it comes to our pain, we need to learn how to sing over it. Don't let your pain 
be louder than your praise. No, you got you got to you got to sing over it. You got to talk over it. You you got to let the devil know that even though you may be experiencing pain, and that's what Job meant when he he would say as he went through his trials that yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yea, though I, 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 I've been tried in the fire, I won't come out better than what it is. That you got to have a praise that's higher and, and louder than your pain. You have to sing over it. You got to uh, not only sing over it, you got to speak to it. That in your pain, you, you got to talk to your pain. You got to remember what God said you are and, and who God said you are and, and what God says about your pain. He said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You have to speak to your pain and speak to your situation. I shall live and not die. You got to sing over your pain. You got to speak to your pain. And then you got to sing through your pain. That even though your pain may not go away when you want it to go away, even though your pain may not stop when you want it to stop, you still got to keep keep on singing. You got to keep on praising God. Got to keep on looking for God to make a way out of no way. Well, uh, Mark started the book by declaring that most of our problems are the result of our hearing problems. That we don't really hear God. And when you don't hear God, we misinterpret what he is saying. Yeah, it's like you trying to read my list when you can't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> but God is always talking to us. So allow me to uh, to close this by sharing some insights uh, that he kind of closed the book with. First of all, that you are more than what you see, that you aren't, uh, 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 or, or you are more than your mistakes, that all of us mess up. Uh, none of us, quote unquote, are worthy other than the fact that God loves us. God absolutely loves us. And he don't love you any more today than he loved you 10 years ago or earlier in your life. He's not going to love you any more down the road. He absolutely loves you. Listen, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on him. If he had a nightstand, that's where your picture would be. God absolutely loves you. He loves you so much. The prophet says that he has us tattooed in his hand. That whenever he looks at his hand, he sees us. God absolutely loves us and that we are somebody special because we are God's children. We're made in his image. We're the apple of his eye. We're more than conquerors. We're new creations, new creatures in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're, spe we're special and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Because of who we are in Christ, God absolutely loves us. And God absolutely is talking to us. Absolutely. Every day he's speaking to us. Whether he's speaking to us through opportunities, whether he's speaking to us through our dreams, whether he's speaking to us through our desires, he always speaks to us through, uh, through his word. He speaks to us through people, through promptings, and yes, even through our pains and our bad times, he's speaking to us. Our identity issues are fundamental misunderstanding of who God is. He says guilt issues are misunderstanding of God's grace. Control issues are misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. God is in control, not you, not me. Anger issues are misunderstanding of God's mercy. God can be merciful to whoever he chooses to be merciful to, and he doesn't need any of our permission. It's amazing to me how upset we are when God, is, when God uh, 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 shows mercy to other people, but yet we want mercy all the time. Our trust issues are misunderstanding of God's goodness. Listen. If you struggle with those issues, it's time to let God's voice be the loudest voice in your life. Well, he speaks through his word. He speaks through his passion or our passion. He speaks through the opportunities that he gives us. He speaks to us through our dreams. He speaks to us through people and through promptings and through pain. We just need to make sure that God's voice is the loudest voice in our lives if we really want to overcome our hearing problem. Because you can't keep ignoring God and then think he's just going to keep giving you chance and chance and chance again. Because when God wants us to get closer, he doesn't shout at us. He whispers to us. So won't you make it a goal in your life to hear God clearer? To walk nearer and hold him dearer to your heart? Won't you make it a commitment in your life that you want to hear what God has to say to you every day? Perhaps he want to use you to be his voice in the lives of others. 
to use your life, to use your pain, to use your legacy, to help build the church that he's trying to build today. Well, you can get ready to uh, uh, question, questions and answers on Zoom in a few minutes. You can uh, go to that link and join me in, in Zoom. I look forward to your questions and we could interact. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll keep Lady Sandra here. She can answer some questions uh, as well that um, uh, we all could be better. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Can we do that? God, how we love you, and we thank you for today. It's been a great day. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for speaking to us through um, means we can comprehend and we can relate to like people. Uh, you speak through anything, but you use people, our family, our friends, our foes, sometimes even strangers, old people, young people. You speak to us through people. Thank you, God, for getting a little clear understanding of these divine nudges that we get, these promptings that we get, that we think something told me to do that, and we come to realize that's a nudging, that's a prompting, that's a timing issue of God. And when we act in a timely manner, then some really great things happen in our lives and, and in the lives of others, simply because we responded to the promptings and the timings and the nudges of God. But God, the most thing that we struggle with the most is you speaking to us through our pain. And so help us, oh God, not to concede to that which we hate, but to contend for the faith, to believe that you are such a good God that even on our bad days, you deserve our best praise. That we ought not to let what's wrong with us stop us from praising and worshiping for what's right with you. So I invite you, oh God, to continue to unplug our ears to open our eyes, to make ready our hearts that we may always receive your will for our lives. Save the soul that is yet to surrender to you, reclaim the backslider that have wandered away from you. For your glory, for the growth of your kingdom and for the good of all mankind, I do pray. Thank you, amen. amen. All right, God bless you. I look forward to seeing you on the Zoom call in about two minutes.